Okay, so my topic is a little bit different than the last topic and hopefully not quite as heavy financially. Um, so I'm Peter and I'm the clinical nurse specialist at the Marsden and I've worked with melanoma patients for over eight years. So my, I'm here today to talk about what is palliative care, when to refer to palliative care, what services they offer and I'm going to talk a bit about advanced care planning. So palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of the patients and their families. Um, it's sort of towards, well, the way that we see palliative care is towards the end of life, but actually palliative care can be inputted at any point within the cancer journey. Um, the nice sort of say it's holistic care of patients, so it's sort of not just around um, symptom management, it's about psychological support, we're looking at financial supports and things like that. I mean, I'll give it a minute and you can read it. And I think palliative care means different things to different people. So I've got two quotes from the Royal College of Nursing and NICE, but for you, palliative care might mean something completely different. The key principles around palliative care is good communication, is the main um, key principle. It's talking about what you want and being open and honest and having open and honest discussions with the care provider um, and whoever's providing your palliative care to have on like to be open and honest with you. Um, it's to discuss the priorities of your care, whether it's um, symptom control, open communication, privacy and dignity, um, and it's about what what you want in your care. Um, another key principle is to do a holistic approach. So it's to take in cultural considerations, um, your spiritual needs, like, so it's discussing um, your, your religious beliefs or just your beliefs in general and what you, again, what you want and bring it, making the family involved. So talking to the family um, and providing support for all of your family, your carers, friends, whether it be children, little children or grown up children, everybody needs support and you should be given that. Um, another thing that people find a little bit hard within the palliative care setting is to talk about your pref preferred place of care and your preferred place of death. Um, usually when um, the community team first come out or the hospice team or your Macmillan nurse, when you first meet them, one of the first things they ask about is your preferred place of care and your preferred place of death. It's probably not what you want to hear when you're sort of meeting them and they're talking about symptom control or they're there to help with some, some financial support, but actually that is important to have at some point because then they can try and if the time comes that you need end of life care, they can try and put into place what your wishes are. So what services are provided? I mean, the main reason that I refer patients for palliative care is for pain management and symptom control. Sometimes you're quite far away from your treating hospital, so you know it's easy to ring up the clinical nurse specialist and say I've got pain. You know, I, you know, within my team, I try and contact your GP to try and get pain relief out, or I you know, try and contact a local hospital if you're keyed in with your local services to try and get your pain control managed. It is much easier if you have um, a local community team within the hospice setting or the community palliative care setting that can actually get you pain management sort of then and there. Um, other symptom control that we generally refer for is nausea and vomiting, um, diarrhea, constipation, shortness of breath, they're sort of the main ones. Um, we also refer a lot for psychological support. Hospital services, well, hospital that I work at, we do provide psychological support for patients, but again, patients come from all over the country and, you know, you, it's, a real, it's a bit hard to tee up the psychological support service on the same day as your clinical appointment, so 
coming back a couple of times for that is just not convenient for people. So we do um, often refer to your local community teams for um, psychological support, and that can be for your carers or families as well. Um, financial assistance and advice, um, the palliative care services are actually really good at providing financial assistance, um, completing the PIPs, your DS 1500s and things like that, if they deem that necessary. And sometimes they know better what's available locally to you and what services you're actually available for locally. Um, they provide holistic care. Excuse my spelling mistake. I can't spell Reiki. <laughs> but um, a lot of um, palliative care services um, do sort of have day hospices where you can go for massage, you can go for aromatherapy, Reiki. They have bits, um, services where you support groups, where you can meet other people that are in a similar situation. Not necessarily with the same cancer, but patients having cancer treatment. Some people find that very helpful. Other people find it not so helpful. Um, and they do offer bereavement support for your families should you die from your melanoma. Um, for the bereavement support, I always think that it's good to sort of try and get to have a good rapport with the palliative care services and for them to have a really good rapport with your family or your carer support network because then they can offer a much better bereavement services. Who may be involved in your care? So um, you've got your hospital team who treat your cancer and give you your immunotherapy, surgery, whatever sort of treatment you have. You've got your clinical nurse specialists, which again, are part of your hospital team um, who provide a lot of support for you. Um, You've got district nurses, if you have dressings or if you need injections that you can't give yourself, things like that, you do tend to develop a pretty good rapport with your community team. Again, I've put your community palliative care nurses in here or your hospice team. Um, some people may have social workers involved, but I think the key to a really good service and um, is the GP. Um, we use your GP a lot to get drugs, uh, like, you know, supportive drugs. Again, if it's pain relief, if you're nauseated, sometimes, you know, you go home or you contact us and you're having side effect from the immunotherapy and you need steroids urgently or just for urgent review on whatever, you know, we get your GP to see you probably more than other services. Um, so... If it's, there's a take-home message, it is try and have a really good relationship with your GP. <laughs> if you don't like your GP or you don't feel that they're supportive, my advice would be change services. And I know I'm from London, so that's probably easier said than done if you're sort of in smaller communities, but I think you have to have a really trusting, good relationship with your GP to help any sort of palliative care services. When to refer. So the palli uh, these are the recommendations from the palliative care industry. Is um, palliative care should, should be offered to cancers early on in the course of their illness. So um, it should be instigated as part of active cancer treatment. And early and regular assessment for patients, regardless of disease stage, you know, helps the palliative care process. However, I think in general practice, this is not what happens. Palliative care services just don't... I mean, that I don't think a lot of them have the resources to see you right at the beginning. So stage one, melanomas, even though the recommendations are you should be offered palliative care, you know, I don't think that um, actually that's something that they would take the referral for, even though we do try for some people, you know, because you do need psychological support at stage one and at stage three and at stage four. But they're the recommendations. They, again, we can put in the request for palliative care services, but a lot of requests do get denied these days. And I think there's a lot more coming back 
than actually getting accepted for these early stage cancers. Um, there's a new government initiative between Macmillan, Marie Curie and NHS England, and I think there's a few more services in there as well. And basically there's six ambitions to bring about the vision of having early palliative care involvement. And so it's to see each patient as an individual, each patient should have access to care. Um, you've got to maximise comfort and well-being. that the care is coordinated between the services. So if it's social work, um, your hospital team, your GP, you know, there's a nice sort of coordinated care pathway. Um, all staff are prepared to care, which, and, it, and the community teams are sort of prepared to help and that there is the services in your local community to provide all of this. This is an initiative that started in 2015 and I don't really think it's got much further than this at the moment. Um, so this is also the foundations that they're building on for their care is personalised care planning. So everybody has, is treated like an individual and you sort of plan the pathway in the care for each patient individually, which I think we are try we are doing and I think with melanoma patients now with the way treatments are I think that is something that we are striving towards um, shared records is a big thing in London there's a program called coordinate my care so for patients where you're referring to palliative care services and it's only I think within the M25 at the moment um, there's an electronic record which the paramedics have or the ambulance service has access to, the GP has access to, um, accident and emergency services have access to, and it sort of says where you are in your cancer process and what treatment you're on and what your wishes are for care. And so that is something that um, I think is working quite well, but it is about actually putting in the, co uh, the coordinate my care pathway early on. Um, education and training for uh, members of staff. It should be a 24-7 access to palliative care services, which I think they are trying to do, but that's a slow process. Um, evidence and information. So I think they're sort of looking at more clinical trials and more sort of service evaluations of the palliative care services. Um, and it's involving the patients and their families and their carers into these decision-making processes. Um, Co-design and leadership is more for um, uh, healthcare professionals. So then um, I'm going to move on to advanced care planning because if it's about who calls the shots. And with advanced care planning, then as a patient and as a family, you have more... Uh, more control over what actually you want your, how you want your pathway to go. So um, it's a discussion of future care. So uh, it's defined as a formal decision making process that aims to help establish decisions in the future and future care. And they can make, be made at any stage of the cancer journey. So it's to think about the future and what is important to you. Um, to talk to your family and friends about what you want. And so everybody knows what you want to happen to you when you get sick, that you can't make decisions for yourself. Um, thinking about having a lasting power of attorney, which is someone who you appoint to make decisions on your behalf. And you have to have them separately as a health care healthcare and welfare um, power of attorney and a financial one, a power of attorney. I mean, they can be the same person, but I think it's two separate documents that they need to fill out. Um, you record and write everything down. Um, you d again, it discuss your plans with your care team, so then they can sort of know, you know, when's enough enough for you as far as your treatment goes. Um, and further discussions sort of need to be around refuse, your right to refuse treatment. I mean, everybody has a right to refuse treatment, but if you're quite unwell, when is that for you? 
and um, you do not resuscitate orders. So it's sort of putting that into your hands as a patient or as in the hands of your family. Um, and just share the information with everybody and make sure that someone knows where all of these documents are. So then if you do go into hospital or if an ambulance is called, then you can sort of take that. They know where those documents are and they can just show them. And you can review it regularly. I mean, what you decide today in three months' time might, might not be what you want to do. So you can always review it. And just because it's set, you've written it down doesn't mean it's set in stone. And what to consider is, again, it's what's important to you. What do you want to happen when you get sick or when you've had enough of treatment or, you know, when you just can't make decisions for yourself if, you know, you lose capacity? Um, and what, don't you want, what do you not want to happen? And who do you want to speak for you? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a partner or a family member. It could be a friend. Um, so why is it important? Sorry. So it's in, important so then you have, you've got the right to be involved in your care and you've got the right to make decisions about your care. It, gives, it empowers you to discuss what's important and what you think is important. As healthcare professionals, what we think is important doesn't always match up with what's important to you. It gives you the opportunity to discuss your preferred place of care and your preferred place of death. Um, and it gives you some control over that. It doesn't always happen that you know, your preferred place of death might be in a hospital and you know, we know the situation in hospitals, they know his bed or things like that, so that might not happen, but it gives us as healthcare professionals a chance to try and make that happen. Or if it's at home, you, know, you can put in hospital beds and get things in place sooner rather than later. It helps you plan ahead. It reduces hospital admissions, especially um, towards the end of life. You know, people sort of, not panic, but if something sort of goes wrong, your family member or someone might call an ambulance and then you get cut off to A&E, you know, it sort of stops that happening. And it helps you receive the care that you want and for your, like, helps you with your wishes. Um, there's... I've just put a couple of links on there to some sample forms. And I actually, I've had a look at them and I think the Macmillan one is actually really good. If, you know, you want to click on and just sort of see what they've got. And they've got information, their, their booklet is actually really good on information about what it is and how to complete it and, you know, what sort of information. And then what do people usually include? It's sort of ceilings of treatment, so it's how much treatment they want to receive and when enough is enough. Um, guardianship, so like for family members, if you've got young children, like who will look after the children. Um, it helps with your financial affairs and wh how you want your money distributed, um, whether you want to be buried or cremated, um, whether you want to donate your body. I don't, you know, some people do want to donate their body to science and then... You know, that sort of lets your family know what you want. Um, and randomly, I, and this was a quote that I found in one, is that I want, you know, I want to be cared for in clothes and not my pyjamas. So if, you know, towards the end of the life, you'd rather wear clothes or pyjamas. You know, I would like to have showers even to the end rather than sponge baths, you know, and that is important to some people. Um, pets welfare. I had never considered this, but... You know, people are very concerned about what happens to their pets and this has come up a lot in a lot of different conversations that I've had recently, so I have included it. And then, you know, it is about your right to refuse treatment or if you're too unwell for your family to say, no, enough's enough, and you've got it documented. And I think that is it.